All right, so in lesson two, we're going to continue introducing and reviewing Python. So here's part two, and here's what we're going to cover. We're going to look at an additional data structure, dive into some of the functionality you can do with them. We're going to look at functions again, because I really want to stress some things. Some string operations in detail. We're going to look at I.O. again, because knowing how to do I.O. and using with statements is going to help us later on when we start getting into uh, using the data access cursors, which is part of ArcPy. Some scripting basics, how you can format a script. And then classes, which is going to be very important when we use the Python toolboxes. That's part of ArcGIS Pro. So our data structures we're going to have is a way of storing data. And we're going to look at the list again. And we, we've been using lists since the first part, and you've probably been using lists for quite some time. And a list is a collection of information that's enclosed within square brackets. It's a mutable object, so we can append to it. We can get other information uh, associated with, with the list. So we can take this object A and append a new value to it. So we're going to add a single value at the end, and we're going to add that 43 on the back of the list, and our list has expanded. So to do that, we use the array function that's built in with lists. And then we also can get the count, which shows us another number of items in the list. So if we want to go ahead and count the items, let's say we have a random list A, and we want to call count on that. And we want to find the number of instances of A within our list. So we can see that we have A. We have three A's. And if I change that to C, if I run that again, we have one. Some more methods that exist on lists that we haven't really gone over is remove, reverse, extend, sort, and how do you delete items out of your list? So let's look at an example of how to use these functions. So we're going to create a list called my list with three integers and two strings. We're going to say my list.remove and we're going to put in the value we want to remove. This will scan through the whole list, and when it hits the first instance of one, it'll remove it from the zero index and shrink it. Then we're going to reverse the order, print out the list, extend it by adding four more strings, and print out the results. So let's see what happens. So the remove went in, and it found the first instance of one, and it removed it. Then we reverse the order of the list. Notice it does it in place. We didn't have to reassign it back to my list. Then we print out the list again. And now and extend, we're going to extend another list onto the end of our current list. Lists are very powerful and they can be used as other data structures to help you uh, do things. So you can use them as stacks and queues. And stacks are, is a data structure that is basically called last in, first out. So think of it as a stack of plates. And as you keep putting more things on top of the, as the plates start stacking, it's, you can't get the bottom plate until you remove all the plates above it. This means that when the data enters it at the end, the last data will come out first. So let's say we have a list here and we're going to use this method called pop. And pop allows us to simulate that stack method. So it's going to pop out the last value at the end of our list. So here we're going to have our one, two, one through six, and let's run it. So the first one is going to pop out the value of six, and then we're going to print our list, print our list, append one at the end, print it out, pop it out, and see what we get. So we're going to do two pop operations. So we initially have the value six gets popped out. Now our list is missing the six. Then we're going to go ahead and append the value back to our list. So we have one and one. And we're going to pop that value and notice it's one again. And now we're back to that original list of one through five minus the sixth integer. Another powerful component of Python, and I think it's really interesting and helpful, is called list comprehension. And this is a simple inline method of constructing lists. So you can take any uh, for expression. So remember that goes through a list of objects, uh, whether it be the range function or a list you defined, and you can manipulate each uh, value in this 
item in there and you can perform some operation on it. You can even do filtering by appending if statements at the end. So let's say I have a list and it's one, two, three, and I wanna square them. So I can go through using a single line expression, do X and do my exponential two for X in A. So for it. so the way this works is that for each item in A, which is one, two, three, multiply that number to the second power. So we have one to the second is one, two to the second is four, three to the second is nine. Another powerful data structure, and it's often overlooked when uh, people talk about Python, is sets. And sets are list-like structure, but it doesn't allow duplicates. So let's say you're, you need to build a filter and you want to make sure that this value doesn't have, isn't already in that set that you have. So you can use a set to ensure that once the value is inserted, there isn't duplicates. It, it's the advantage of doing that is that it's very fast for searching. Like I said before, is that you can look up, uh, instead of a list. If we were to use a list, when you when you check if something is in a list using a conditional, like uh, if two is in some list of values of one to a million, it, it will actually um, have to walk over each item in that list until that condition is met. So with a set, we know there only exists one instance of that. So it's really easy to find if a value is in something. And we can create a set from both an array of values, so a string, a tuple, or um, a list, or we can cr create it from a string. And in this example, we're going to show how to create it from a string. So we're going to create a variable a and pass in our string, and it's going to say John Hopkins, and we're going to say this is a set. And when we print it out, notice that we have the the squiggly brackets, and it has each singular instance of the letter within John Hopkins. So. We can also insert new values and discard and remove values with sets. So we can say a equals set John Hopkins again and discard h. So we're going to remove h from our set and then we're going to check if z is in there. So we say z, uh, so we now have the h. We print z and a returns back false and we've done our checking. We can then go a dot add and let's put z back in and let's do the check again and rerun our code. Now we see that Z is in A because we've added it into our set. Dictionaries have a look kind of like sets, except that it's a key, it's a set of unordered key value pairs and the keys have to be unique but the values can be anything. They're declared by using that squiggly bracket like we did for set, but in this case, we're doing some key value, colon, some value, and then we close it by another squiggly bracket. We retrieve the value by passing in the key in square brackets. So I'm gonna declare a dictionary with two keys of GIS and amazing with the values of course and Python. I'm then gonna retrieve my value by doing G, DGIS and it should print out course. I'm then gonna add a new key by doing D square bracket, my new key. We're gonna say equals website. So a single equal sign, remember that means assignment. And then we're going to update the amazing variable and assign it from Python to dog and let's print out the final result. And what we can see is that first we print out the value as we expected for GIS. Then we added in our Amazon value website and we updated amazing from Python to dog. In part one, we saw functions, but I'm just gonna reiterate some important things that we use the def to define a function and it allows us to use repeatable code. Let's say we want to check if a string is a palindrome and we need to do this multiple times in our program. So we can create, we can either use a Lambda function 
or we can just do a simple function to have it over and over again. Because let's say we need to use it all over our function. So I'm going to define my definition and then do return s.replace. We're going to remove any spaces and we're going to see if it's equal to the reverse order of the string without any spaces. So this is something we haven't seen before. We have if underscore underscore name equal name underscore underscore is equal to main colon and then some code underneath it. If I was writing this code in a, a .py file and not in a Jupyter notebook, I would have this in there because this indicates to the program that, hey, this is where I need you to start. This is the main part of my program. And I would put all my logic above that. It's just a nice way of organizing it. So I'm going to say my S1 is cat and I'm going to check if it's a palindrome. Then I'm going to say is S2 equals never odd or even. And I'm going to check if it's a palindrome and get back the value. And this is going to return a Boolean. So cat is not a palindrome, but checking never odd or even is a palindrome. Let me reverse it. Additional thing about functions and one of the advantages is that functions have variables and the variables can be either required or optional. Inside our definition, we do def the function name and then we declare our variables. Well, a variable without an equals and a value is a required parameter. An optional parameter is one defined like variable b. So b equals negative 99. If we do not provide anything for b when we call our function test, b, the program will assume that b it should be negative 99. So the way this would work is we would say, let's say we have a function called test and we need to check if one value is greater than or the other. So we have our two values, a and b, but we want the default value to be negative 99 in this case. So if I just pass in test of a equals five, it would just say if five is greater than negative 99, and that would be true. But I could, I could set A and B. I could say A is five again, and B is 10. So it would check if five is greater than 10, and that would return false. Something that I want to point out and you might encounter along the ways is it, you never really want to make a list a default value. And the reason is, I'll just show you. So here we have our function bad idea and a variable a and data equals an empty list. Every time we pass in a, it should append a to that empty list or so you would think. So we're going to append three numbers to our default value of empty list. Notice every time the value stays within our list and it reuses that data value. In order to get around this, it's better to do something like this. If data equals none, set data equal to none. If data is none, data equals empty list. And now when we go ahead and we append our data, we should get the expected results where we should just have a single list with one, two, and three. Doc strings are very important because code is a living thing and often it can be around for a long time. And the doc strings explain how your code should work. It's useful in both interactive mode, so like this Jupyter Notebook, or used for just writing documentation, especially if you have a large API. So when you, every time you create a function, you should have a doc string. And this is done by doing three uh, you know, quotation or single quotes, and then you write description of the function, and then you define each variable. So you just do colon, and you can just do the the name uh, of the variable, or you can put arg and then close colon, the type it is expected, and then some description. And the same for all your other variables. And then if your value return, whatever your function returns, you should tell the user what it returns at minimum. If your function returns a specific error when invalid 
inputs are put in or an encounter some sort of exception, maybe you have custom exception handling. You should also put under returns what it raises. So we saw in lesson one that strings are represented by data between either a single quotation or a double quotation mark. And it's also important to note that in Python 3, unlike Python 2, which just sunsetted in 2020, all string data is Unicode. We can write a string by, de by just declaring a single quotation, inserting some text or numbers or values, and then closing it off with the same type of qu uh, quotation mark, single or double. Strings, if you want to display strings that, that are multiple lines, just like when we declared a doc string, you can do that same sequence and you can have line one, line two, line three, and then we just close it with the same three brackets. We can find the length of strings by using the length built-in length method. Some other additional properties that are very useful is title, uppercase, and it returns all strings in uppercase, all lowercase. Strip, which removes white space from the front and the back. And you can even say if you want to just remove the, the values, the strip from the front or strip from the back as well. Strings, we can find values as well as we continue on with strings by using the find. And what it does is it returns the first location in the word or letter. So I don't own a cat is our string. And we're, we're going to find own and it's going to find the position where own exists in the first spot. So here it is, eight, Remember, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, it's right there. Strings can be sliced like lists and it follows the same syntax. So we just take our string and then we do start, colon, stop, colon, step. Where start is our beginning location, stop is our ending location, and the step size is the number of steps we wanna go. And the default is one. Inputs and outputs of data, basically reading and writing of data. We saw before, we saw the, the various methods that we can use, but the most common are uh, read, write, and append. The syntax is that we you use the open, built-in open method, pass in the path to our location, and you declare what you want to do. By default, it's read, or you can explicitly declare it. We can then go ahead and read the whole thing in one shot and load all our data into a variable, or we can read it line by line, and then we close it at the end. The with statement, though, allows us to take care of some of that, the closing function, so we don't have to worry about it. So we can say with open that same text file, we can read it as R and assign it the variable F. We're gonna say data equals F read, and then when we exit this with statement, it's gonna automatically close our file with us. So it just it's just a little um, helper that allows us to, uh, that, will remember for us to close our files once we're done with them. Now, now here's, a, here's a full example. So we're going to, we see once again, if we want to write, we're going to use the with statement with writing. Notice the difference between the previous one is that we say we're actually writing data and this gives us the function write on our file object and we can write some value to that string. We saw before with the if e underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals equals the main string colon uh, in the previous example. Now I'm just going to explain it a little better. So it's going to point where the code starts for execution. Often we see this code in .py files. You really don't see it in Jupyter notebooks, but in this case, I'm just doing it as uh, for example. So let's say we create a file and we call it test.py. We first are going to do our imports. We're going to define our functions and then we can either call a driver function to do our code or we can put all the logic in that if statement. So here we're going to import math and OS and we're going to define our function. We're going to do uh, e to whatever x is and then call the driver which is going to run f and then it's going to start the execution right there in that if underscore underscore main. So let's see in a full example from the code we had before. So here's our inputs. We defined our functions. And now we're going to start here. 
And here you go, we have all our, our values that get printed out when we raise e to x, which starts, comes from the range zero uh, through five. So e to the zero, e to the one, e to the two, e to the three, e to the four. The next important thing that's gonna be very important for the remainder of this class is classes. And classes provide the means of bundling either data or functionality together. And the nice thing about Python is that they're very simple to declare with other programming languages. So to define a class, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do class and then you give it a name. Class supports inheritance, but in this case, I'm not inheriting from something. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna put it open and close and then a colon. Now my class has been declared. Typically, you would put dot string here. So just like we did with functions, you wanna describe what your class is doing. Classes have initializers that can take zero to n inputs. In this case, I'm not taking any inputs to initialize my object. And in, what initializer is gonna say is you must pass in this data or this optional data into, my, into this class in order for it to work. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna declare a variable here, self.data, and to be an empty list. So when this class is made, first class, it's gonna enter the initializer and create a variable dot self.data. The self function is gonna allow us to access anything within our class. So that's our scope within the class. And now there's a variable called data that can be accessed between the various other functions within our class. I also declare two other function called reset and add. First, let's take a look at what reset does. And I said in my doc string that resets, it resets the data to an empty list. So all it does is do self.data equals empty list. So we're just resetting that empty variable, that data variable back to itself. And then we have an add function. So we have add self comma a. A is an object and the data can be inserted into the list and it's gonna return a Boolean. And here I'm using some exception handling and I'm saying try if you can insert the value into the list, return true, but when an error is raised, return false. So here we have our class and it's run. So we do, first we can access that, that class-based variable. So recall that when we created our class, we come into the initializer and we create the data. We can then access off of our class that data parameter because we made it public. We can then start adding data to using the add function. So you do my class dot add sam, my class dot add i am, and then we can print out the data and see that we actually inserted values to it. Then we can call reset which when we print it out returns none because we don't have an actual return value here. So it always returns none. We learned that in lesson one. And now we have a class that does some uh, logic to, to update and add data. So this ends lesson two.